My name is Raymond Hain, and I am a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the director of the Providence College Humanities Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's forum, and in particular to welcome our guests from off campus who are participating in the joint Brown University Providence College Conference on Plato's Timaeus. The Providence College Humanities Forum, now in its second year, is an initiative of the Development of Western Civilization program, and its purpose is to provide a regular space outside of the classroom for the entire Providence College community to deepen its understanding and appreciation of the humanities. Its goal is an integrative one, to bring all of us together in the discussion of serious and abiding questions at the heart of our lives as human beings, and to connect us in our reflections on such things with the broader academic community. It's particularly exciting, therefore, that the forum is a part of this joint conference as the host of today's keynote address. This kind of collaboration around the humanities is precisely the aim of the forum and the model of what we hope to continue in the future. Please join me now in welcoming to the podium Professor Colin King, a colleague of mine here in the philosophy department, and a co-organizer of today's conference who will introduce this afternoon's distinguished guest speaker. Once again, welcome to this afternoon's Humanities Forum. Thank you so much, Raymond. Um, we have to thank Raymond also as the initiator of a Humanities Forum in the first place. He's the demiurge of that. Um, and that is the institution which is supporting uh, this conference. I also want to thank Marie-Louise Gill very warmly, who's a most collegial colleague from Brown and with whom it's been a real pleasure to work on this. And uh, I also have to thank the dean of my college who has contributed uh, funds um, to this event and also to my department. And it's been a really providential experience. Uh, integrating all kinds of institutions uh, working together to support this conference. And for those of you who are just coming in, there's a handout. Um, there was a colleague that I worked with in Berlin who would always forego introductions by saying, so-and-so, of course, needs no introduction, and then he would just let the person go ahead. But although I could really do that in the case of David Sedley, I won't do that, because that's kind of a cop-out. <laughs> um, so I'll say some things. Professor David Sedley is well known to scholars in ancient philosophy as both an author and an editor. In addition to long terms of service as editor of Classical Quarterly and Oxford Studies in Ancient Philosophy, he's edited several philosophical papyri, and as co-editor with Tony Long of the Hellenistic Philosophers, he's created a resource which made later ancient philosophy more accessible than it ever had been to readers of the English language. And he also significantly contributed to an increased attention to the philosophy of Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Neoplatonism in the field of ancient philosophy. As an author, he was and is unavoidable for any serious student of ancient philosophy, in particular also of Plato, with major publications on both the Cratylus and the Theaetetus. His book on the Theaetetus is remarkable as a new interpretation of the Socratic question, the question namely as to the proper identity, historical accuracy, and function of the figure of Socrates in Plato's dialogues. Professor Sedley inter interprets the figure of Socrates in the Theaetetus in terms of an image which the figure of Socrates himself invokes as an explanation of the purpose of his elenctic or refutational practice and dialogue, the image of a midwife who helps others bring their own brain children to the world, and then aims to determine what the precise value of these brain children is. Um, now, the thesis that he develops in the course of that book in particular is subtle, and it resonates also for students of ancient argumentative practice because it attributes to Plato and his Socrates authorial independence to both of them in the dialogue, which enriches the text, creates a subtext, as it were, of retrospection on the part of Plato as author to his former mentor. Professor Sedley is also engaged in ancient philosophy and science through the history of ideas, 
and in confrontation with the lens of the present, as evidenced in his Sada lectures on creationism and its critics. In his writing, he's made ancient philosophy come alive with a multiplicity of perspectives, something that I very much appreciated as a young graduate student when he was publishing all his work, and I was actually sometimes frustrated that he kept on coming out with books in the 2000s that I had to keep reading. <laughs> um, he was really productive then. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure to invite him to deliver this lecture. Well, thank you very much. The very kind introduction and the, saying this sentence is my chance to, just to check that I'm, my voice is going into the microphone and coming out the other end. Good. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very grateful to, to the invitation to this forum, also to Dimitri and Mary Louise and others who've been involved in organizing this conference, which so far, I should say, has, uh, been, going, has been extremely enjoyable and instructive. I hope everybody can see my handout. Apparently, if you need one, there's still some here. Okay, uh, Plato's Timaeus. Um, it's a literary and philosophical masterpiece whose unique importance in the corpus of his works is too easily and too often overlooked owing to the difficulties of interpretation <coughs> that it presents to the modern reader. In antiquity, from the time of Plato's death onwards, Platonists recognized the speech of Timaeus in this dialogue as the privileged entry route into Plato's system. Already on the dialogue's first page, we're alerted to the difficulties that lie ahead by its cryptic opening lines, which appear as text one on the handout. I'll just read the little exchange. One, two, three, but where Timaeus is our fourth of yesterday's guests, now due to be hosts, Timaeus replies to Socrates, some kind of sickness has befallen him, Socrates, for this is a gathering that he would not have missed willingly. Socrates says, well then, isn't it your job and that of these others also to play the missing person's role on his behalf? Certainly, says Timaeus, and we'll do our best not to fall short. So where is the fourth? From the ensuing exchange, we learn that one member of yesterday's audience, who was due to speak today, has unexpectedly failed to turn up. Timaeus, Critias, and Hermocrates, the remaining three, will be required to stand in for the missing person, making speeches, please note, on his behalf. Who is the anonymous absentee? Surely, and it has already been suggested in discussion this morning, by Christopher Rowe in particular, uh, from the ensuing exchange, um, it's, it should be cl clear that, the, um, that this is the person whose habitual absenteeism constitutes paradoxically a kind of indirect but overwhelming presence in the Platonic dialogues, Plato himself. This suggestion that the missing speaker is Plato, already voiced in antiquity by a Platonic scholar named Erchilides, but more or less ignored by modern scholarship um, until very recently, like today, or except that Mary Louise has, uh, has advocated the same view in the last few years. It rests on comp a compelling textual hint. The unexpected absence is explained by Timaeus as follows, just to repeat, some kind of sickness has befallen him, Socrates, for this is a gathering that he would not have missed willingly. Hardly by accident, this calls to mind Plato himself, who according to uh, the Phaedo text, two on the handout, according to an almost unique, explicit self-reference in the Phaedo, was going to absent himself even from Socrates' final conversation on the, on the day of his execution because of sickness. If this is right, it's the habitual absentee Plato who is to be represented by the speech of Timaeus, among others. It's become common in modern Platonic studies to speak usually dismissively, of what people call the mouthpiece theory, um, according to which the main speaker in each dialogue is Plato's mouthpiece or spokesman, a conduit for Plato's own arguments and beliefs. Plato's brilliance, it's suggested in reply to this so-called mouthpiece theory, it, Plato's brilliance, it's, they say, it lies partly in the fact that his dialogues did no more than portray individual thinkers asking investigative questions without necessarily committing even them let alone the author himself, 
to any of the specific answers that they entertain. I have no doubt at all that many passages in Plato, perhaps even some whole dialogues, fit that description very well. But it would be a mistake to infer that all do. In other words, that Plato never develops and defends his own doctrines in the mouth of his main speaker. That Timaeus, for one, will indeed be voicing Plato's own views seems to me to be very strongly implied by the covert authorial self-reference in the dialogue's opening lines. Socrates, we learn, will be speaking on behalf of the absent Plato. Sorry, did I say Socrates? Yes, Time, um, it's, Timaeus will be speaking on behalf of the absent Plato. Timaeus will not simply be voicing what Plato himself might have said. His ensuing speech, which includes a highly mathematicized account of the world's creation, has been widely recognized to import a significant component of Pythagorean theory, a recognition captured in the ancient consensus that the South Italian visitor Timaeus is himself a Pythagorean. For this reason, the numerological opening, one, two, three, and the, oh, but where is the fourth, has itself been recognized as gesturing to the iconic Pythagorean so-called tetractes, the number 10 represented in triangular form as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. The fact that it's Socrates who utters these opening words means that he is in effect inviting and expecting the Pythagoreanized account of the world that is to follow. And that in turn establishes a key continuity with the earlier dialogue Phaedo, where Socrates in his last hours of life had confessed his inability to work out an account of the world as the product of intelligent causation. Adding that he would still gladly become anybody's pupil, as he puts it, to learn such an account. In the Timaeus, that wish is fulfilled by the authorial device of an imaginary philosophical gathering where Socrates becomes Timaeus' appreciative auditor and thereby learns just how the world was intelligently created. Plato, as author, is thus conveying a double debt. His original Socratic heritage is now to be enriched with Pythagorean input. And it's this new philosophical synthesis of Socratic and Pythagorean ideas whose ownership is being claimed by Plato in those opening words when Socrates invites Timaeus to expound it on behalf of the missing participant. Even for anyone who remains skeptical about Plato's insertion of this coded self-reference, the Timaeus would still constitute a key text in the mouthpiece debate. For what we, in fact, find in Timaeus' speech is little short of a complete philosophical system whose components include numerous theses defended elsewhere in the Platonic corpus by the dialogue's respective lead speakers, often but not always Socrates. This fact is the proper starting point for any answer to critics of the mouthpiece theory. Plato, it turns out, did have a system of his own, having defended its major components piecemeal in a wide range of, of dialogues, each time through the voice of his current main speaker. In the Timaeus, we have a unique opportunity to see large areas of the doctrinal map being pieced together. It's not quite as simple as that, because in the Timaeus, those doctrines are readdressed not in the primarily ethical and analytical modes employed in other dialogues, but through the lens of physics, the domain within which Timaeus's speech itself falls. To put it in terms employed by a later source commenting on the recurrent platonic idea that the goal of life is to become as godlike as possible, in the Timaeus, Plato speaks about the same um, godlikeness theme as elsewhere, but addresses it physicos, to use the Greek term, that is to say, from the point of view of physics. What I mean by from the point of view of physics is well illustrated by a celebrated example in the opening chapter of Aristotle's work on the soul. I quote, the physicist and the dialectician would differ in how they define one of the emotions. For instance, what is anger? The dialectician will say a desire for revenge or something like that, whereas the physicist will say a boiling of the blood and heat around the heart. Despite the difference of perspective between the physically orientated speech of Timaeus and Plato's more typical works of dialectic, numerous theses defended dialectically by Plato's other main speakers feature in the physics expounded by Timaeus. 
unmistakably as components of a system. We should conclude that Plato, what, that whatever formative stages and changes of mind he may have undergone, did have or develop a global system, many of whose major components were eventually conjoined in a speech put in the mouth of Timaeus, with the addition, as already noted, of a strongly Pythagorean coloring. Moreover, there is at least one case of a cosmological doctrine made explicit uniquely in the Timaeus, which must nevertheless have been developed long before, since Plato can be found already taking it for granted in a dialogue that few would hesitate to date many years earlier than the Timaeus, I mean the Phaedo. In the passage of the Phaedo, which appears as text three, Socrates argues for the cyclical reincarnation of souls on the ground that were dying not reciprocated by a return to life, everything would end up dead. Why doesn't he say that if dying were not reciprocated by a return to life, everything would already by now be dead? The fact that he doesn't argue that way suggests that at the time of writing the Phaedo, Plato did not assume the world and its inhabitants to have a temporarily infinite past. Instead of adopting such a premise, the sentence's grammar shows Socrates to mean that without reincarnation, life would, at some point in the future, cease in the world, and that this, for some unstated reason, could not happen. What might that reason be? It must lie in a doctrine emphatically asserted only in the Timaeus, namely that although both the world itself and the souls that inhabit its resident species may in principle be perishable, they must in practice be going to endure forever thanks to divine favor. No one but their creator is powerful enough to destroy them, and he, being supremely benevolent, would never be motivated to do so. This Timean doctrine of divine protection is itself prefigured elsewhere in the Phaedo, where Socrates wholeheartedly approves the thesis that the power of goodness, as exercised by a cosmic intelligence, holds the world together more enduringly than any merely corporeal foundation could have done. That's Phaedo 99c. Thus, it seems to emerge as a doctrine common to the Phaedo and the Timaeus that because the world and the souls that occupy it are the products of divine craftsmanship, they will on the one hand, like any artifact, have had a temporal beginning, but on the other, because the products of the best craftsmen are the most durable, they must enjoy the absolute maximum of durability and therefore be everlasting into the future. Many of Plato's admirers, ancient and modern alike, have refused to accept that he meant this temporal asymmetry literally, an, a finite past but an infinite future for the world. The evidence of text three, if I'm right, indicates that on the contrary, he had already thought out and endorsed the asymmetric thesis long before he wrote the Timaeus. The approach I'm advocating is not an attempt to deny that Plato's ideas evolved over time. He certainly did not include in the Timaeus all the potentially relevant theses that his main speakers had defended elsewhere. And in some cases, Timaeus voices positions ostensibly incompatible with them. Nor conversely, do all Timaeus' contentions have recognizable counterparts in other dialogues. Unsurprisingly, given how little Plato had written elsewhere about cosmology, biology, and kindred subjects. So the Timaeus must have been showcasing plenty of new and rethought ideas. My point is rather the following. When we find a topic from an earlier dialogue recurring in the Timaeus and looking significantly different there, this is not necessarily, as often assumed, a sign that Plato has changed his mind. It's at least as likely to reflect the fact that this time it's being viewed through the lens of physics. What I want to do next is illustrate my assertion that in Timaeus' speech, we witness a complete cosmological system incorporating, in a guise appropriate to a physical treatise, major philosophical theses defended elsewhere by Plato's other principal speakers. On the handout, I've listed 12 of them on the first side of the handout, and the list is by no means complete. I will skip one or two of them because I think it would uh, become tedious to go through them at too great length. We can start with four familiar Platonic theses on which Timian, the Timian creation story is founded. Actually, with three, because I've just noticed I'm going to skip the fourth. So one, 
The principle that God is the cause only of good things, never of bad, is formally defended by Socrates in Republic Book Two, starting from the unquestioned premise that God is intrinsically good. And in books two and three of the Republic, the principle is applied widely to the construction of an educational system for the ideal city, in particular uh, to the theological cleansing of myths. It recurs in the Timaeus as the fundamental principle from which we are to work out the creator's motive for creating the world. Being good, he wanted everything to be as good as possible and nothing bad, which meant imposing the maximum of order on matter. Two, the Platonic forms viewed as eternal paradigms or uh, um, are another key premise that, uh, of the Timean creation story. The creator, we learn, being a good craftsman, must have looked to the appropriate form as his ideal model. This equation of forms with paradigms owes much to a series of passages on craftsmanship in earlier dialogues, particularly the Gorgias, uh, Cratylus, and Republic Book 10. The difference is that this time the craftsman in question is divine, and his product, nothing less than the physical world, its structure, and its occupants. Three, ne consider next which forms are selected by the creator as his models. Earlier dialogues are concentrated largely on simple mathematical forms such as equality, ethical forms such as justice, and craft forms such as the form of table. In the Parmenides, the youthful Socrates representing Plato's past self is encouraged by the main speaker, Parmenides, representing Plato's present and future self, uh, is encouraged, oh, sorry, he's encouraged to admit a much wider range of forms, including the examples of forms of man, fire, and water. It's hard to doubt that this trio somehow represents the range of forms needed by a creator building a world. For complex reasons explained by Timaeus, the creator found the generic form of animal to be the appropriate paradigm on which to model the world as a whole. And since this generic form is said to include within itself all animal subgenera and species, we can easily infer that in addition to the generic form of animal and those of its subgenera, such as mammal, let's say, there are specific forms of man, horse, frog, and so on, which the lesser gods charged with creating mortal beings must, as genuine craftsmen, have looked to as paradigms. Thus, it's in Plato's physics, and not in the ethics and metaphysics that elsewhere all but monopolize his attention, that the need for forms of natural species becomes inescapable. Likewise, the divine craftsman's reasoning for creating four elementary bodies, including fire and water, and his detailed geometrical design and construction of each of these, requires that there should be eternal paradigms of them too, a point made by Timaeus with explicit reference to the form of fire and implicitly to that of water as well. So as I said, I'll skip item four on the list and go to number five. Uh, and, and following a series of further theses all bearing on the soul. So number five, the cognitive defects of sense perception as an autonomous guide to truth are a prominent theme of the Phaedo. The senses systematically mislead us regarding the truth, and these same defects reappear at least implicitly in Republic 6 to 7, where sense perception is closely associated with the lower stages of the line and cave progressions. To take just the latter of these, in Plato's most famous image, human beings are compared to prisoners tied up in a cave, experiencing nothing but shadows which approximately correspond to, but hopelessly misrepresent, the realities that lie outside. Here, the cave in its entirety symbolizes the perceptual realm. Even the educational program that can, after years of high-level study, enable our intellects to escape from the cave and eventually to contemplate the forms is said to be deficient insofar as the mathematical sciences, which constitutes that program, can barely help making some use of perceptual data. But if we scour these texts for the reasons why sense perception is so deceptive, the main answer will turn out to be the negative one, that the senses have no access to the eternal forms, where stable truth properly lies. The Timaeus returns to this theme, but addresses it from a strictly physical perspective. 
Intellect intellectual access to the forms is achieved by circular motions in the head, reproducing in miniature the rotations of thought, which the world itself, being an intelligent living being, manifests in the heaven. Both the world god and the intellectually advanced human being are thereby thinking eternal truths, the changelessness of their thoughts being physically embodied in their endlessly repeatable circular motions. The reason why this intellectual attainment is fraught with difficulty, and even in the best case takes many years to perfect, is that the naturally circular motions in our heads are from birth disrupted by the non-circular motions with which the senses receive their own data and transmit them to the rational soul. The process of intellectual advancement thus involves the gradual restoration of thought's circular motions and its reassertion of dominance over those sensory bombardments. Item six, in Republic Book Seven, as I've already mentioned, a sequence of five mathematical sciences is recommended by Socrates as providing an educational bridge from sensory to intellectual cognition, or to put it in terms of their generic objects, a progression from becoming to being. The final two sciences which complete this transition are astronomy and harmonics. In the Timaeus, we learn how this opportunity for our soul's self-advancement towards philosophy has been built into the very fabric of the world by its designer. Astronomy is the privileged discipline by which the soul can internalize the mathematics of complex celestial rotations, thus more or less literally sharing the thoughts of the world god. Both in making the world soul's supremely rational motions visible and in giving us eyes to see them, our creator and his divine assistants have made possible the transition to philosophy, the greatest of all goods bestowed upon humankind. And as with astronomy, so too with harmonics, the faculties of voice and hearing were bestowed on us largely to make music possible, not for the sake of mere entertainment, but above all, to perfect the harmony within our own souls, thereby once again replicating the harmonic intervals that structure the world soul itself. Thus the design of the universe, along with the matching design of the human being, provides the cosmological basis for the education that the Socrates of the Republic had outlined in purely cognitive terms. I'm going to skip item seven, go to number eight. In many dialogues, predominantly those usually dated comparatively late, Plato's main speaker associates dialectical method with the twin processes of collection and division, roughly the method of taxonomic analysis applied by constantly dividing and subdividing an initial genus. This widespread practice finds a single brief counterpart in the Timaeus, where collection and division are applied to the taxonomy of bodily disease, with a later indication that they could likewise be applied to the taxonomy of diseases of the soul that is, to, mor to the analysis of moral vices. This is one of many ways in which the Timaeus offers the prospect of building bridges um, from physics to ethics. You get the methodology going for, for bodily diseases and then you apply it to um, psychological diseases, that is, to moral vices. Number nine, probably the best known example of the pattern I'm describing, and therefore not in need of much elaboration now, is Timaeus' account of the doctrine that the soul has three parts, the reasoning or calculating part, the competitive part, and the appetites, the three of which must interact harmoniously if one is going to lead a good and happy life. This thesis is dialectically argued by Socrates in Republic Book Four, and put to work by him in Republic Books Eight to 10, and in the Phaedrus. But where those dialogues employ it primarily in the context of moral psychology, the Timaeus is, of course, concerned above all with what we can learn from a physiological approach to it. For example, the rational part of the soul is located in the head, nearest to the divine heaven with which it has a natural kinship. The competitive or spirited part is in the chest, where, on the one hand, the narrow neck impedes it from infecting the brain with its amb ambitions, while on the other hand, its proximity to the brain puts it at reason's beck and call when it functions as, very roughly speaking, willpower. Finally, the appetites are centered appropriately low down in or near the midriff, 
where most of their bodily functions operate. We also learn of the soul part's functional relation to organs such as the liver and the intestine. In short, the new focus in the Timaeus, as we would expect, is the soul's physiological functioning for the organism's overall good. Item 10, despite his endorsement of the three-part psychology according to which the soul contains certain irrational drives, Timaeus preserves a degree of continuity with the earlier dialogue, such as the Protagoras, when he presents an adapted version of the old so-called Socratic denial of akrasia, that is to say his denial that there's such a thing as lack of self-control or weakness of will. This is Socrates' celebrated paradox that nobody does wrong willingly. In those earlier dialogues, Socrates' ground for the denial had been that everybody aims exclusively for what is best, so that if some people fail to achieve what is best, that can only be due to a failure of knowledge. They can't be knowingly acting against their own um, preferred goal. Plato maintained varying versions of this paradox throughout his life, still in his last work, The, War, the Laws, in fact. What we get in the Timaeus may well strike us as a dilution of that old Socratic intellectualism. Vices, Timaeus explains, are diseases of the soul, not willingly acquired by the soul, but partly caused by lack of proper education and partly forced upon it by rampant bodily pleasures and pains, themselves in turn physiologically explained. For example, porosity of the bones allows sperm to flow too freely, which in turn induces sexual licentiousness. This idea of a soul forcibly constrained by bodily processes recalls the body-soul dualism developed by Plato in the Phaedo, more than it does the classic Socratic dialogue such as the Protagoras. But actually its closest parallel in the Platonic corpus is in the short argument against the possibility of weakness of will found in the Clitopho, a passage whose significance has gone virtually unnoticed owing to the widespread conviction, which I don't share, uh, though I know there are people in this room who do, that th um, this short work is not actually by Plato. Well, I think that it is. Whereas the Protagoras had simply denied that you can be defeated by pleasure, the Clitopho, followed closely in this by Patimaeus, had conceded that you can be defeated by pleasure, but not willingly, since the very notion of being defeated entails unwillingness. Thus, yet another familiar Socratic doctrine recurs in the Timaeus, this time radically altered by the dialogue's physicalist approach. 11. If Timaeus' doctrine that no one does wrong willingly is not, stro not strongly intellectualist, an intellectualist strand does nevertheless rise to full prominence as Timaeus' speech nears its climax. Earlier in his speech, we learned that, as also maintained in Gorgias and Republic, Justice is rewarded with happiness, eudaimonia. And we're now correspondingly advised to cultivate the orderly motions of all three soul parts at 89E to 90A, closely echoing the Republic account of justice and its rewards. But this time, Timaeus immediately adds that the highest kind of human happiness, the one that offers us the maximum share of immortality, is the life of pure intellectual attainment in which you identify the immortal, rational part of your soul as the very core of your own being. This corresponds the, to the concession made in Republic Book 7 that an intellectual life spent outside the cave would be happier than the political life of one forced to return to the cave and govern. To accommodate it to his cosmological theme, Timaeus presents this intellectual happiness as the restoration of the truly circular motions in the head so that they resemble those of the divine cosmos as manifested in the celestial rotations. This is, in effect, the physics of happiness. Twelve, finally, the immortality of the rational soul. That's the final item on my admittedly incomplete list of Timian doctrines dialectically defended by the main speakers in other dialogues. The immortality thesis emerges fully formed as an integral part of the dialogue's cosmology the rational soul rotating within the approximately spherical human head shares a divine origin with the circles of the world soul rotating within the perfectly spherical heaven. And the unbreakable causal laws which make the world soul an everlasting divine product likewise make the human soul necessarily everlasting. 
Okay, well, I've tried under these headings to convey a sense of what familiar Platonic doctrines tend to look like when adapted to a physical context. In other words, what it is for Plato to present his philosophy physicose, that is, in the manner of a physicist. With them in mind, to consider a passage which immediately follows the divine craftsman cr creation of the mixture from which souls are to be made. And this is text four, I'm starting about seven lines down. And when he had compounded it all, he divided the mixture into a number of souls equal to the number of the stars, and as assigned each soul to a star. And now the bit in bold. He mounted each soul as if into a vehicle and showed it the nature of the universe. It seems clear that thanks to the privilege of this guided tour, each soul, by the time of its first embodiment, would already know the nature of the universe. We can surely recognize here the incorporation into Timean physics of yet another Platonic thesis defended in earlier dialogues, the doctrine of recollection. Among Plato's most famous but also most controversial doctrines is the claim that all learning is recollection, namely recollection of truths which our souls learnt before birth and which they bring with them to this life, initially in a latent form, but ready to be brought to the surface either when sense perception triggers our memory or thanks to the kind of dialectical questioning in which Socrates specializes. In Plato's Meno, the theory is demonstrated by Socrates when by appropriate questioning and use of diagrams, he leads an uneducated slave to come up with a geometrical truth. That Timaeus is alluding to this doctrine is supported by the passing reference in the bit I just read out to the soul's vehicle, the Greek word is ochema. This recalls the Phaedrus, where the whole disembodied soul is called a vehicle, same word, and its rational part is a charioteer driving two horses, which represent the other two soul parts, driving that chariot around the perimeter of the heaven in a procession led by the gods. In the present passage, too, the souls circle the heavens in a God-guided educa educational tour. This time, each of them riding not a chariot, but a star. The change of vehicle from a presumably metaphorical chariot to a presumably literal star is natural enough, given A, that it's in keeping with the dialogue's cosmological motif, and B, that Timaeus does not follow the Phaedrus myth in making the two lower soul parts, which the horses represent, capable of discarnate existence, so could not repeat the chariot metaphor. There should be no doubt that an echo of the Phaedrus and thereby an allusion to the recollection thesis are intended. It seems then that the doctrine of recollection occurs not in three Platonic dialogues, Mino, Phaedo, and Phaedrus, as is commonly said, but in four. One significant difference from the Phaedrus is that whereas there the soul charioteers crane upwards into the region beyond the heavens, where the forms are, here in the Timaeus, the rational souls, riding their stars, get to see what lies within the heaven. This difference need not reflect a doctrinal change on Plato's part. Rather, it reflects in a way that should by now be familiar, the cosmological filter applied by Timaeus. Under heading three, earlier on, for example, we saw that the only forms mentioned by, um, in, by Timaeus are those of natural kinds. Not because Plato has changed his mind about the range of forms, but because those are the forms of primary relevance to cosmology. And so too here, the soul's prenatal grasp of cosmological truths in particular is emphasized, rather than, as in other dialogues, their prenatal grasp of primary mathematical or moral truths or entities, simply because these are the kind of truths that underlie physics. That very difference does, however, confront us with an alarming novelty. In the Mino and Fido, the buried knowledge that our souls bring with them at birth is exemplified by mathematical and moral knowledge. And at least in the Fido, this is knowledge of transcendent forms. There's been widespread agreement that Plato can't possibly mean to place all knowledge in this class, including knowledge of empirical, contingent, and changeable truths 
such as how to get from Athens to Larissa, to an adapt an, an example from the Mino. You couldn't possibly recollect that from a previous existence. By the, for all you know, by the time you're reincarnated, they may have built a bypass. Rather, it seems, the sort of knowledge that you might hope to recover by recollection, that is, by searching inside your own inner resources, should be expected to be knowledge of truths, which reflection leads you to see could not have been otherwise. Mathematical truths were always Plato's paradigm of these, and he clearly expected moral definitions, once discovered, to belong to the same broad class. By contrast, the nature of the universe may seem too empirical and too contingent to permit investigation by means of pure reason. Indeed, according to Plato's mature epistemology, expressly resumed in the Timaeus, there is no knowledge at all of the sensible world, but at best true opinion about it. Nevertheless, the present passage clearly hints that those true beliefs, or the true opinions, or at least some of them, are subject to recollection. How could that be? I think the answer is as follows. Down to this point in the Timaeus, sorry, uh, and uh, to this point specifically in, in Timaeus' own discourse, the reasoning behind his cosmogony has in fact been remarkably a priori in character along the following lines. Given the opportunity, an essentially good creator God was bound to tidy up any disorder in, present in the state of things. And in doing so, he would of course want to impose the maximum of orderliness. Given this, it can be worked out from first principles that he will have fashioned the available materials into a single spherical and intelligent universe composed of fire at the periphery um, and earth at the center in order to ensure visibility and tangibility with two geometrically proportional further elements in between. That the world's thinking will have been visibly structured in accordance with the best series of harmonic ratios, the supreme orderliness of its rotations will have uh, brought measurable time into being, and so on and so forth. The most fundamental work of the cosmologist is thus mathematical, and cosmology is explicitly presented by Timaeus alongside astronomy as a mainspring of intellectual progress towards philosophy. True, the initial prompt to pursue cosmogonic questions has come from our perception of the heavens, as Timaeus carefully points out in the same passage, but even that detail captures the fact that, at least according to the Phaedo, the intellectual act of recalling prenatal knowledge normally gets its initial trigger from sense perception. Apart from that, the amount of empirical data cited in these initial cosmogonic moves made by Timaeus is minimal. Timaeus does admittedly acknowledge in a much discussed passage at 29b to c that a cosmological discourse is best served by seeking maximum likelihood, the Greek word is akos, rather than altogether determinate results, because its subject matter is the realm of unstable becoming, not that of being, and is a likeness of a paradigm, not the paradigm itself. Nevertheless, he seems to think, reconstructing the divine creator's cosmogonic reasoning is an exercise that we can perform out of our own innate intellectual resources, following just an initial prompt from sense perception. Seen thus, the nature of the universe is a potential subject for platonic recollection. In at least one respect, the nature of the universe does inevitably differ from the objects of recollection, such as mathematical ones. Rather than working out this or that truth for ourselves, in cosmology, we are reconstructing someone else's reasoning, the reasoning exercised by the original creator. This may be one motive for Timaeus' use of continuous discourse in contrast with the more familiar platonic practice of showcasing the reasoning in interpersonal dialogue involving question and answer. Timaeus, with his supreme understanding of the structure of the heavens, is presumably relying on his own soul's superior recall of the creator's works and of the reasoning underlying them. His analysis of the divine creator's actual reasoning is impressive, but it's still not an exercise of dialectic. It could scarcely have been extracted by interrogation from an interlocutor not similarly versed in the relevant disciplines. If Timaeus's cosmogonic reasoning has an absolute starting point, consisting in a principle that is securely known in its own right, 
he leaves us in little doubt what that principle is. It's the essential goodness of God, because that is the opening premise, what he calls the supremely authoritative principle, the archen kurio, kuriototatan. I think there was one too, I put in one too many syllables there, kuriototatan. The, the, the supremely authoritative principle from which the remainder of his creation narrative follows. And how, according to Timaeus' own narrative, can he and his audience know with such security that God is essentially good? By a recollection, I suggest, thanks to their soul's direct prenatal acquaintance with God and his works. One surprise remains. In text four, just following the bit in bold type, after taking the newly created souls on a tour to learn the nature of the universe, the creator went on to teach them the fated laws of transmigration. They learned that after incarnation as men, they should expect either demotion to women or to whichever lower rank of the animal kingdom matched their current moral character. Or if they live justly, promotion to eventual disembodied bliss. Are we to infer from Timaeus' narrative about the prenatal class that our souls attended concerning the principles of transmigration that these principles too are innately known and available for us to recollect? I very tentatively suggest that we are meant to infer that. Outside the context of physics, Plato might have put the same point by saying that what is innate in everyone is the knowledge that virtue leads to happiness and that vice leads to unhappiness the central contention of both the Gorgias and the Republic. This truth is hardwired into everyone and can therefore, according to Socrates in the Gorgias, be extracted by dialectical questioning, even from a character like Callicles, who vehemently denies it. But because in a Timean context, moral theses are expounded from the perspective of physics, that ethical point is instead put in terms of soul's prenatal understanding of a matching biological law, namely that the animal kingdom was to be so structured as to give concrete reality to the dependence of unhappiness on vice and to that of happiness on virtue. To end, let me return to the scene in text four where the creator sh showed the souls the nature of the universe. Which of Plato's other three recollection dialogues does this recall? What has prepared the ground for it is neither the Phaedo nor the Phaedrus, dialogues in which the discarnate soul learns and later recollects a specific set of metaphysical objects, the forms. Instead, it's the doctrine's first and most general introduction in the Meno that is most immediately evoked by Timaeus. In the Meno, no specific objects of recollection were singled out. Instead, Socrates remarked, this is text five, he remarked that there is no reason why having recollected one thing, you should not go on to discover everything else, giving as his ground the twin facts that A, the soul being immortal has been everywhere and seen everything, and B, that, I quote, all nature is akin. If we possessed only the Mino and the Timaeus accounts, we would have little trouble in taking the Mino's references to the soul's travels and to the kinship of all nature as being directly picked up and given an explicit cosmological focus by the Timaeus. As Timaeus might have put it, having recollected one thing, namely the perfect goodness of God, you can go on to discover everything else, that is, the nature of his entire creation. There's also been much debate as to when and how Plato thinks the original learning by the soul can ever have taken place. In the Meno, this is text six, Socrates concludes that the soul must be always, or as he puts it, for the whole of time, in a state of having learned. Problematically, it seems that this either endlessly pushes back in time any original acquisition of the knowledge, any original learning, um, with the result that it can never have taken place, or it makes knowledge the soul's inalienable condition from infinite time past, in which case it becomes hard to see what role its prenatal learning is meant to play. The Timaeus account cuts through the obscurities in two ways. First, by assigning to our souls a determinate moment of creation before their first incarnation, and second, 
by dating the original act of learning to that same occasion. Since according to this dialogue, time itself began only with the completion of the world's creation, and the first two events in time were the creation of star gods and of individual souls, the assertion in text six that the soul will be, quote, for the whole of time, unquote, in a state of having learned, comes very close to being vindicated by the Timean narrative. As for how our souls originally learned, or at least how they learned the nature of the universe, we might be tempted to interpret their guided tour of the universe as representing divine revelation. But if, it, but if so, it was not mere revelation. I've been urging that this prenatal lesson is what provided our incarnate souls with their intuitive knowledge of God's goodness and their consequent ability to trace his cosmogonic reasoning from first principles. If that's right, the creator will have used the occasion of the cosmic tour to enlighten the souls about the reasoning underlying his chosen structures. On that ground, and because disembodied souls must in any case lack sense organs, we should take the divine revelation, if such it was, to have itself been a transmission of, of pure rational understanding, and to have included the learning process by which our souls were taught to comprehend the forms of animal genera and species, those of physical elements, and so on. Outside the physical context of the Timaeus, Plato's fuller description of this reasoned revelation would probably have included our souls learning all the forms, and quite possibly a great deal else besides. But to repeat my central point one last time, what we get in the Timaeus is rather than a global conspectus of Plato's philosophy, no more than a privileged glimpse into it from one important but incomplete perspective, that of the physicist. Thank you very much. Well, um, that, that, thank you, that, that's an important question. Um, the, some of the passages you're describing, Carmody's, Protagoras, aren't actually giving us any physiology as far as I can remember. I mean, there's, there's something about a headache, but that's about as, as far as we get into physical. Yes. Right, but it's assumed that we already, uh, we don't need to know anything more about ingestion than people already know. We don't have to probe in so what's going on inside the body. Uh, I think it's, it's an entirely compatible, well, I, need to, I needed to make this clear, certainly, but now that you've asked the question, it's entirely compatible with what I'm saying, that there could be passages in other dialogues where you do a bit of Hippocratic um, speculation. Um, you're probably right about the, the passage in the Sophist. But I, what I the way I need to put it, and I, I admit I didn't, is that um, 
Plato's works, as each dialogue as a whole belongs to a certain genre, and, or at least each major passage. Timaeus, to speak, is as a whole, is his contrib contribution, Plato's contribution, to a traditional a genre, namely works on, on nature, periphysios. Um, but of course, there can be a paragraph here or there where, that's, where something else is going on. And of course, the opening discussion with Critias itself is, is, um, in, is, is not physics. And likewise, in a work which is basically an ethical work, or what, I mean, they, and of course, this is a classification that goes way back in antiquity. There were, some works are logical, some are, um, some are ethical, and so on. Um, it's perfectly possible for there to be a, a brief um, excursus into something, something physical. Uh, so there's certainly some physics in the Phaedo, for example, um, uh, some in the Philebus, although, of course, the Philebus may be later than the, than the time is. So, uh, yeah, I think I need to say, I do need to put, say this is not an absolutely rigid division between genres, but nevertheless, um, the time is, the, the broad th general thrust of the time is, is to show us how to look at disease, uh, sorry, um, mor moral vice um, or immortality or whatever it may be from the point of view of how does it come about physically. On stars, not in them. I think. No, actually, it's not absolutely clear. But yeah, okay. So what's going on? Yes, not, not, it's necessary, but not necessary for the souls, because some of them are created already very pure, and they could just stay that way. Necessary in order to animate the animal kingdom. There had to, so there had to be, so not only did there have to be enough, as many souls as there are living beings, maybe not including plants, um, but at least as many as there are animals. But what's more, there had to be enough souls of a suitably low grade of purity to go into you know, dogs and, uh, and rabbits and so on. No. An animal is a soul plus a body. No. Um, no, because all of, the, all of those souls actually were going to be reincarnated, have their first incarnation specifically in men, and I mean male human beings. Uh, and, it, and at that stage, there was no system of reproduction. Men, men, male, the gods had to adapt male bodies to female functions at a, w only when souls were ready for recycling in a downwards direction. I mean, because it, everything here is up for grabs as regards whether we take it as traditional myth or science or, some, or something else, but I'm just poke face reporting what the text says. Yeah. They, they are rational souls, but they're not functioning rationally because they're not in sufficiently spherical heads. So they're, they're, they're dormant. I mean, there's either it's because they're in the flattened head, say that of a snake, that, that, that they can't, um, that, that they get squashed out of their circular motions, or alternatively because they're already out of their circular motions that they get put into a, a head that fits their, their current shape. But they're not thinking. But they, will, they, they can revive in a ne the next incarnation if they're lucky. No. No. Thank you.
That's what it is, yes. I, I agree that's a, that is using the notion of physicos in a slightly different way. Um, sorry, I had to... Yeah. Um, every case would have to be taken on its merits because I, I see your point about taxonomy and uh, I might, you know, I could be persuaded to drop that, but I, I, what, what strikes me is that, well, what I'm taking to be the, um, an account of recollection in terms of physics is dropped in, a, in a, more or less in a single sentence and, and that's, the, the, the model for that is set by the, the, the passing reference to collection and division. He, as the, he wants to get as, as many doc, platonic doctrines in as possible, even if they just get a passing mention. Uh, uh, yeah, using for collection and division for things which are, go, are, are going on in, un, unseen by us inside the body, but have to be postulated in order to um, make understand the relation between different diseases of the body and, and or of the soul. That's it's just that the involvement uh, there of um, some some amount of speculative physical analysis. I accept that that's a borderline case. But um, for example, you you just mentioned you, you asked about the cognitive defects of perception number five. That seems to me a very clear case of what I'm trying to say because the reason why we're told that uh, perception is cognitively damaging to us um, is that uh, the non-circular motions that enter us through the sense organs disrupt the circular motions, and that's all physical speculation. Uh, it's true it's not all bodily, but it's all physical. It's all in things going on in space and time. Um, so those are, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I'm inclined to concede your other point and say, but still, uh, Maybe, maybe keep that in, or maybe keep it in, but more marginally than it is now, because there is quite a wide range of different ways of, of doing it. it you know, it's because the periphysios genre, the genre of writing on, on nature, did cover a very wide and heterogeneous range of topics. You know, he, he does, you know, the, the, there's the magnet and the mirror and all these things. He, he beautifully does pretty well all of those. Oh, right, yeah. I, I, I abstain, I'm sorry, if people didn't hear, what, what do I make of the Critias? I don't make anything of it. <laughs> oh, no, I just don't, I just happen not to have a view about it, because, partly because it's an unfinished, well, I think it's, uh, you, you, I mean, some, some people here think it wasn't by Plato, some people here think it, it was meant to stop in mid-sentence, as it does. Um, I, it's not that I, particularly disagree with those views, I just don't have a view about it. I, I apologize for that, but... Um, uh, um, um, but uh, I d I'm not claiming anyway that every dialogue of Plato's has, um, a, 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 has a mouthpiece in it. Um, that I, well, sorry, I should... There's a, great, there's a great deal that goes on in Plato's dialogues where, where the mouthpiece theory is not really at issue one way or another. Most of the symposium is, is, is such a case. I, I personally think the Theaetetus is one where, the, where Socrates is, is at no point Plato's mouthpiece. So it's, it, you'd have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, I think.
it. Um, um, I, 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 you'll have to tell me if I've got the second question wrong, but I, 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 is it not enough for me to just say again, he's covering in the time is everything that was traditionally covered in the, the genre um, of, of, of physics, which is down, again, saying it down to the, the creation of human beings, but not, you don't go on into the, it, you didn't traditionally go on into human history or anything beyond it. Um, is that, does, does that address your point or not really? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the Fido is the most interesting case, I think, but you know, um, even his account of um, teleological causation with it, you know, illustrated with the example of Socrates, why Socrates is sitting in prison, is not theorizing about causes in the, in the positive way that the time is does. It's theorizing negatively. Well, don't call that a cause. Actually, when he gets down to it in the time is, it turns out those things are causes. They're just another kind of, they're sunitia. Um, can I just go to your, your first question? Um, I don't know if there's an incompatibility or even a, a sharp difference between the Republic's account of astronomy and the one in the time years. According to the, the, the Republic, as I understand it, but I know this is controversial, when you do learn astronomy, you must start by looking at the stars. Uh, 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 but uh, what you end up doing is understanding the laws of spheres in motion. And that's, a mathemati that's mathematics, and you could do that even if you went blind or even if you never looked at the, the, the stars again. Um, I don't think, I'm just thinking this out aloud here because I hadn't got a view on this previously, but I don't think the time here makes it clear whether there too you should eventually leave behind the things in the heaven and simply concentrate on your, the, the mathematical gains that you've made. Um, it, I think it's com compatible with, with the Republic view, but because it's about physics, it, it concentrates on the physical bit, which is actually the physical, the, the at least partly physical science of um, studying the stars. You know, you've got to stay out all night, you've got to keep notebooks, uh, you, you, uh, um, you've got to get, get a gnome on and other physical equipment and so on. So I, I think he's concentrating on the physical as the aspects which are close to the concerns of the physicist without definitively differing from the Republic, but not, not closing that gap. You don't look very yeah, satisfied. What's the thing about days sorry, in the Republic? Sorry. Ah, right, okay. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very grateful for all these remarks because I, I agree that there are some fuzzy edges here, and it would be a bit funny if there weren't. But uh, it's when you re think of the time as a speech as a whole, that it, I mean, it's overwhelmingly clear that, he, that the questions he's asking about a lot of otherwise familiar topics are questions of the, um, the kind that physicists would claim to be able to answer, what particles, what invisible particles that things consist of, and so on. Yes. Yes. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, well, because I was told that I would be talking to a rather general audience, uh, and so I left out the, the most technical bits. Uh, I, uh, it wasn't by uh, entirely uh, free choice, but um, I, no, I, I totally agree. Um, the, uh, there are two, you mentioned the Theaetetus, and of course there was a series of dialogues where Plato made progress with the problem of explaining falsity, and then he arrived at what seems to be his definitive solution in the sophist. But there are two versions of it. One is when you say something false, you, um, you, you, you mistake uh, that, that which is for, for something other, th other than it. So you, you mistake being for otherness. You confuse being and otherness, and being and otherness are both components of the soul. Uh, um, or um, on the second analysis he gives about a page later, um, you confuse same, uh, sameness with otherness. Uh, and uh, that, it seems to be that one where you, that, the, that the Timaeus explains. How, can you, how could you confuse sameness with otherness? Because you're, your circle of the same and the circle of the, of the other, of the different, as you were just saying, get... Um, they get short-circuited, they're not kept sufficiently apart. That could never happen in the world soul, because as astronomers can attest, the, the, the motions along those two circles are always absolutely perfect. But in childhood especially, and often in adulthood too, our, the, the, the circles in our own heads get, get squished against each other. And so you've got a very nice... I, I agree with you, and I'm, I was sorry not to include it, but uh, um, it, you've got a very nice case where... Actually, um, when you look at the, the big debates that go on about exactly what Plato's solution to the falsity problem is in the sophist, um, I, I'm not sure that anybody, but I, I may be overlooking somebody in this very room, uh, I'm not sure that anybody has actually tried to resolve that debate um, by looking at the Timaeus. Uh, I, the Timaeus gives us half, it, anyway, it gives us a, a physical version of the second solution. It doesn't give us a version of the first solution, but it gives us the materials for supplying that because, as I said, um, being and difference are both components um, of the soul. So that it, it gives you a, a basis on which you could explain how somebody con confuses uh, what is um, with, with, with what is different from it. Uh, yeah, but thank you for mentioning it. Do you mean between... Right, no, I, th I don't think there is one that Plato, a different, I don't think there's a different one that Plato would have spoken if he'd been there. Uh, this is just a code for saying, um, I'm putting the, for, by Plato, for saying, I'm putting this into the mouth of other people called Tim uh, Timaeus and Critias and so on, but I actually claim ownership of it. And it, they're, they're, this is, uh, that's, they're speaking on my behalf, they're my puppets. Uh, and th I, th I think I, I found enough parallel examples of, se of coded self-references to make that more plausible than it would be if it just stood on its own. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. I see. Yes. So why does he say, yeah? Well, the idea of that you can't actually achieve perfection it is uh, as a common one in Plato. You, you, you get as close as you can to perfection. You, you become like God as far as is possible. You give the most echoes account you can, but it won't be monimon uh, and so on. Um, I mean, I realize that I'm turning that phrase into something boring and, uh, and perfunctory, whereas you're making it into something interesting. But I'm kind of nervous b about what I might be conceding. Um, I, does anybody, can anybody say, is L.A. Po, is it more likely that this means, we, we'll tr we, as far as we can, we won't leave anything out? Or is it more likely that it means, as far as possible, we won't fall short? I'm pretty sure it can, probably, it can mean both equally, and that itself would be quite concerning. Um, and maybe the ambiguity is not an accident. I'm, I'm trying to think the, 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 perhaps the way you're thinking. Um, yeah, well, it could be implying that Plato himself could actually say more about this. Uh, they, they, we're going, they're going to do their best, but actually, if Plato had been there, I'm, I'm, I'm not just trying to follow your train of thought. Yeah, if, Oh, I see. Right, but this is leaving out things in the physics. So, for example, you know, the, uh, only an hour or two ago, Christopher was complaining about the, the, the about an argument being so tr squashed up and truncated that it was hard to take it seriously. There's, lot, there's surely lots of scope for spelling out the arguments in the time years much more fully, not the speculations about the un uh, invisible entities. I think, but there are quite a number of really important arguments in the time years, and probably. Judging by t today's discussions, um, probably a lot of us feel that if only Plato had spelt them out a bit more, we would have a clearer idea of how the arguments are meant to work. Mm. Yes, yeah. Oh, uh, you mean, no, but well, what time is its undertaking is to stand in for Plato specifically with regard to the nature of the universe, not with regard to the whole of philosophy. So it's only in that regard that there, that there would be a question about whether he's fallen short of what Plato himself could have delivered. Yeah, that's, re that's really interesting. But I think what, even that question, why does he leave out the, uh, um, the, the metaphysics? For, for right, yeah, well, I, I, anyway, I, I'm just going to, at the moment, address the question, why does he leave out f the philosopher kings and the metaphysics that they learn? Well, maybe that's got something to do with the fact that Timaeus is going to d deliver the metaphysics and therefore it's got to actually be removed from Socrates and given to, to, to this Pythagorean. According to me, yes. 
Um, but I thought you would agree with that. I mean, you, I know that you, you think that Critias is an inappropriate person to be saying it, but I, I thought you would agree that these are thoughts, these are Plato's own ideas that are be, being put across as best he can, which may not be, I'm just for taking up Margaret's point, he, 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 he may not be able to do it completely satisfactorily, but um, I think, I mean, you, you yourself, I've, I mean, I have I said more than once, you know, Plato is saying this or that when, we, when we've been going through Critias' speech. Well, that's a question, I think, about the character rather than about the content, isn't it? Or do you, or do you think it's about the content as well? Well, I guess it depends on the context of the story. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I was saying to you um, we were when we were discussing this during coffee that I think some, sometimes Plato does like uh, to play a little game with having somebody say something which that person could not possibly have said. There's a wonderful passage in the Euthydemus where young Kleinias, who's just had his very first philosophy lesson, suddenly sounds as if he's read the middle books of the Republic. And they have, and, so, and the Crito says, are you sure it was Kleinias who said that? And Socrates says, hmm, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe it was some god who was present who said it. There's, there are games like that where the wrong person says the right thing. Oh, yes. The son, the son of Ariston, you mean, yeah. yes. It does, I mean, it doesn't, I, I'm a bit unsure. I mean, there's obviously some reason why he wrote the beginning of the time years as if to make us unsure whether it's a continuation of the Republic or has some, bears some more distant relationship to it. I mean, it, there was, a, he talks about the festival of the goddess, uh, it may have been the same festival or a different. I mean, in the end, we're pro it probably turns out not to be a complete con continuity between the two. Um, but uh, no, I, I think I'd have to say, that I, although I do think, and I, ha I have argued in print, that uh, there are two self-references by Plato in the, in the Republic, um, I don't at the moment see any way to, to connect that with this. And presumably, the two dialogues are written quite a few years apart. That's just the usual stylist assumption on stylistic ground. But I'd be very happy to, to look for, for further links between them. I just haven't, I haven't thought of any, really. Oh. Yes. Well, uh, uh, yes, go, go on to your other question. And then. Thank you. I, 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 I want to think about that one.
and that would sort of connect how how would that connect to Uh, right. So th that would. I say, well, right. I mean, he does say. Uh, he, he, Socrates does say it's it's your the job of you, Timaeus, um, and, sorry, yes, Yes, uh, he's, it's just the, it's the we, uh, um, we will not, it's the last word, Alex, I mean, Timaeus seems to be undertaking on behalf of everybody present that they will not fall short, uh, so far as they can, they will not fall short of delivering Plato's views. Yeah. But, no, that's fair enough, yes, thank you. And um, there would be questions about how this remark relates to what was maybe never written in the Critias, or if not in the Critias, then in whatever, whatever speeches were still to come. I mean, there's a lot we, where Plato probably, if Plato didn't finish writing the trilogy, or maybe it wasn't a trilogy, but anyway, the, the three speeches, um, then there may be, there ha almost have to be unrevised aspects to this opening because he couldn't get it, he couldn't definitively write, um, fix this opening until he knew how the, 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 the dialogue or trilogy as a whole had gone. But thank you, yes, I, you, you raise a good point. Yes, so that's, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, it gets everything. It gets everything right, but it's only doxa, because you can only have doxa about the universe, not uh, episteme. Uh, and that would be like the slave. In, the slave in the Mina has been brought to has, some true doxi have been brought out, and he could he could eventually go on to have mathematical knowledge, but he have, that there would be no correspondence to that. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 innate, the innateness of knowledge of God is, an, is Cartesian as well. It's not a, it's not a specifically... Um, well, it, mu it must have some plausibility. I mean, the trouble is, maybe you have to ask somebody more religious than me, and maybe somebody more religious than you as well. It doesn't, not that it's very hard to be that in my case. Um, but, um, no, I... Uh, maybe it's... It, the idea may have to be that once you think about the notion of God, um, 
and what we associate with him in the way of creation, you'll see that it, he couldn't be other than good. Yeah, that's that's risky for me. To, it's risky for me to say yes to that. Okay, so take some. I mean, the, my favourite example, although it's not quite the one that's in Plato, is um, there's one thing that we all know, whether or not we've ever thought about it, is that equality is a transitive property. If two things are equal to a third thing, they're equal to each other, and that's not because we can prove it from anything more fundamental. It's already as fundamental as you can go. It's just that you couldn't be rational and not know that's true. And somehow he wants it there to be a similar. A uh, bit, bit, bit of um, fundamental knowledge about God, um, uh, and of course, atheism was a, a vanishingly rare position uh, in Plato's day. Well, certainly in the in the at the date, the dramatic date of the time. Yeah. Thank you very much.